there as far as pistol versus rifle. The big thing, in my opinion, is the pistol you have one, two, two points of contact, and rifle you have three, right? So you have your shoulder to stabilize all that, and it's really easy to, to pull the trigger without moving in comparison to two hands two feet out from your body. You know yeah. What I mean? So yeah. I think that's why it's easier to jump from one to the other than... What's up, everybody? We got a good one for you here today. I am not joined by Mark. I shouldn't say that because it sounds like the reason it's a good one is because I'm not joined by Mark. I, I, we're not going to restart this, but I just want to point that out. It's not okay. because Mark is gone. Don't feel bad for him, though. He's in Alaska hunting bears right now. So that's pretty cool. Maybe we'll have some stories from Correlation him. does not mean causation. Thank mm. you. When he gets back. You are hearing the voice of Ruben Alexson across from me, though, and then also across from me at the end of the table next to Ruben is Tucker Schmidt, who is a new guest to the podcast. I'm sorry that you're missing out on Mark. That's okay. That's but, part uh, of the experience, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Um, but it's all right, though, because we're going to be talking about competition shooting. You know Mark's always talking about just hunting and just stuff, hunting. so he'd try and equate this back to hunting somehow. Yeah. But we're going to be talking about competition shooting. Great time to talk about it now, obviously, because, I mean, if you're down south, you've been talking about competition shooting, you just get to talk about it year-round. Up here, we're, like, just starting to come out of our, our shells. Yeah, out um, of hibernation. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, but, Tucker, we'll let you introduce yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? And what do you do uh, for our listeners out there? Uh, obviously, my name's Tucker. I uh, spend most of my life shooting some sort of competition sports. Uh, I live down in Florida, down in the southeast, and uh, I travel around quite a bit and get to shoot, enjoy the shooting sports. Nice. So that's why Rube was saying you were a little worried about the temperature today. Yeah, it's cold up here. I know it's kind of weird for you guys because it's like <laughs> a warm summer day. It is, yes. Yeah, but it's, it's about as cold as it gets where I live. <laughs> that's so sad. Above <laughs> 50 degrees. <laughs> um, well, so like we said, competition shooting, that's yep. a big thing for you. Um, and uniquely, perhaps, I think there are many people who shoot multiple different types of of uh, shooting competition, shooting sports, you do it at quite a high level across the board, and uh, and you do many different disciplines. So, what types of competition shooting do you keep yourself busy with? Uh, so, like action, so action pistol is USPSA. That's basically run around, shoot targets fast with a pistol, um, multi gun with like Ruben three gun, that type of shooting. And then the PRS is kind of a new one for me. Over the last year or two, kind of got involved in that. That's bolt gun rifle long distance. Yeah. Yep. PRS and long distance shooting seems to be the hot thing right now. Yeah, it I seems like say. it's uh seems like it's getting a lot of traction. They they've you know put a pretty good organization together. They got leaderboards, you know, nationwide, uh, a set a strict set of rules across you know across the country, and I think people are attracted to that type of shooting. Yeah. USPSA has a lot of that similarity yeah. too, where they they keep a. a kind of a tally of the top 20 or the right. top, you know, and then they, they have unified rules. Correct. I think that's a big, a big part. Is this getting into what we were talking about right before the podcast with three gun and just sort of, I'm, I got to throw this out there. Three gun, I think is still very relevant and it still is popular, mm -hmm. but why does it seem like it got really hot there for a while, a few years back? And now I see a lot of people sort of just talking more. There just seems to be more buzz around other sports and not so much the three gun side of things, like PRS or NRL twenty two stuff like that. Right. Why would there's, you say that? I think there's a Am couple right of different that? Tucker. You'll have to like you'll have to kind of gauge off of what I'm thinking, but like I think there's a couple of ways and maybe reasons why that happened. But like you know, some people say like in in 2008 to 2016, a lot of people went out and bought ARs and they were just looking for something to do with it. I don't think that's as much the reason. I think a lot of be people became kind of more knowledgeable to that sector of firearms ownership, but I don't think that's why because the people that were high level competitors in three gun, um, that when it became very visible, it was part of, um, this TV show called three gun nation. And they had a very specific rule set. They went and televised matches and there was a place where you could watch who was doing well in that sport. It's like, I think, or I think kind of to like X games okay. like for a long time, people have ridden skateboards and surfed and done snowboarding. But until someone came along, decided to highlight those athletes, there really wasn't very much visibility. So three gun kind of went into this period with three gun nation where now there's a place where people who aren't involved in the sport can watch it. And, um, 
you know, see what it's all about and then find out where to get involved in maybe their local area. So that I think was a big thing. And then that kind of went away as that organization kind of, um, stopped being involved in the shooting sports community. Hmm. So I think that that's my opinion is that there was a huge amount of visibility, but also three gun doesn't really have a unified rule set. So like kind of like Tucker alluded to there with PRS, they have a very specific rule set NRL being the same way. Um, and it can be tweaked regionally or, or in, in different ways. But, you know, if I have to go to a match, I was just talking about this last week. If I have to go to a match and every time I go to a match, I have to learn a new set of rules or what's going to disqualify me from the match or what targets mm-hmm. are worth two and a half points here and they're worth five points here. Like, it's just, you, you have to like play, even though it's one sport based on the differences in requirements for gear and the different scoring methods, it's like you're playing 10 different sports. Yeah. Even within one sport. I didn't even realize that was the case. Yeah, so I think that's my opinion of why it's the way it is. It's pretty similar, but I think what people are really attracted to is just knowing. Like, you you don't have to question what this penalty is or what this disqualification thing is or or whatever it is. And, like, Three Gun Nation, I think people noticed it originally. Like, I got into Three Gun Nation because I saw it on YouTube or TV or somewhere, and uh, that's kind of where I found it. Then you get on, you Google, you're like, oh, here's where all the matches are. I'm going to go here and meet some people. And that's kind of how it kind of shook out. But uh, most people that don't know or aren't in the community as of yet, um, it's really hard to get information on it. Like you really don't know where to look. You can't just call your local club because they're like, I don't know. You know, you got to know somebody or some place that actually is involved in the game. And uh, in those other formats, basically you can Google and find matches uh, pretty easily. Okay. You, know, yeah. you, can, you can search pistol shooting or action shooting or something along those lines, or even your local club. Most guys know, oh, there's a pistol match right over there. And uh, PRS is very similar to that. So I think an organization with some sort of marketing reach and then, you know, where can, where can yeah. you go to do this? But that could be why that, why it's kind of yeah. fallen off of your radar. Yeah. I think, mm. like, it's still attending matches. Like, we still see all the same people at the matches, right? want to see new people, though. Yeah, that's the we trick. do. Yeah, right. Yeah. So and that's, that, that's probably that's why down. it's not as much on the, the radar of someone who's not super involved in shooting the matches. Interesting. Yeah, I remember because we have uh, over at Vortex Edge, we'll get at our range during the wintertime, we'll have some indoor USPSA matches. And, mm-hmm. and I do recall having our instructors who were setting it all up, they're always referencing, you know, this rule book, how things are supposed to be set up. There's all this stuff around. It, it, you can just tell there's a very centralized governing body to it, which I don't know. I mean, Those it depends on the kind of person you are because there, there is some uniqueness to being able to be like, yeah, we can make it whatever we want. It can be really creative. It can be different. But also then if everybody shows up and they're wondering what the heck's going on and why it's different from every other match they've attended, it can get... That could be a bit confusing. I think that an organization or a particular sport will always have those outliers of those people who perform at a high level, but I don't think there will be an organized effort by people to try and make their way to the top in a certain type of sport unless there is that goal, right? Or unless there's that, that, yeah. Gamification. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I think, yes, there will always be room in the shooting sports for the go to Dave's house on the third Saturday of the month and shoot steel. And we just kind of do whatever we want to do, but you won't get um, an industry or a following of that unless there is something that people who at a high level can aspire to be. Yeah. Right. That's that's kind of my thoughts on it. The question is how do you, how do you, how do you get that going? Yeah. We'll leave that. What? Let's You're the smart one, Rube. Yeah. Rube, you're pretty smart. (laughs) (laughs) Listeners. We're curious what you think. Rube, um, I, I honestly have some ideas, um, but, you know, who knows, right? We'll, le- we'll, we'll let you wait until you make those public. Right. Huh? Okay. Sure. All right. We won't put you on the spot here. But how about I shift gears? Yeah. Back to Tucker. Oh, boy. Tucker, we'll ask you. So you do, anyway, after our little, uh, our little uh, philosophical conversation there, you do multiple different kinds of competition shooting. What was the, what was the one that you started with? What did you do first? And how did you how did you even decide to get into competitive shooting? You've been shooting your whole life, or was it just kind of no, an epiphany you had once? No, or? I mean I've I've had firearms, right? Like you have one for protection, or maybe two or a couple. I was never like an enthusiast by any means, but uh, we just went camping with a, with some guy, and uh, they were shooting a little bit, and you know zeroing guns and stuff. And he's like, you know, you should really come out to a match. It was actually an IDPA match, is, is what it was. And uh, I went there, and a few people asked. Um, 
oh, are you like a Ipsic shooter? And of course, I didn't know what that was. And he says, what did he say? He's like, oh, it's 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 similar to this, but you shoot a lot more rounds. And I was like, well, where can I find one of those? Is basically it. <laughs> and I and I went and did that, and that was kind of the last time that I I really shot the IDPA. It's just a different format, and I really gravitated towards you know the the faster, a little more athletic type of uh, competition. And then within there, I, I found three gun pretty quick, and then just kind of played both of those until recently. And and that's when the kind of bolt, bolt gun rifle, bolt gun thing kind of came along. Okay, got it, got it. And uh, so doing different types of competition, I would say, I mean, what uh, what are your thoughts there around? I have to imagine it helps you all around the board, right? Like just the fact that you do multi-gun, you've done pistol, then you're now getting into bolt gun, long range precision stuff. I can't imagine that one hurts one of the others. No, nope. every gun's going to have some sort of sight picture on it. It's going to have a trigger pull and, you know, basic fundamentals, which I think carry over across all types of firearms. Um, so basically you learn one. I mean, obviously there's going to be a learning curve there. Um, but I, I do believe that like every, every gun you shoot, every time you pull the trigger, you're getting better at some type of fundamental. So you practice on those and, and they do transfer across pretty easily, I, I believe. Yeah. What uh, what do you feel like is if somebody's trying to get into competitive shooting? What's what's the one to start with that will well, be a good springboard into the other ones? I really think focusing on one gun is probably the easiest to start. Kind of get your feet wet, dip your toe in, as you will. Uh, start a pistol match. The, the The thing is, is there's you know roughly what ten, fifteen million new gun owners over the last few years. Yeah. What they don't understand is like if you join one of these organizations, whether it's just USPSA once a month, twice a year type of thing, you're really going to become proficient with your handgun. So it's a really good way to train and learn fundamentals, meet great people, and kind of build a community around yourself to where you feel comfortable in any type of situ- situation with a firearm. Um, all of these are really great for that. So I, I think you should just try to find your local club, check the calendar, you know, find a match that's upcoming or coming up or, or whichever, and then uh, just kind of go. You're going to meet yeah. some great people. I'm sure you guys have talked about this on this podcast. Everybody's wanting to help, share gear, get you started. Just come out and come out yeah. and shoot. I do feel like there is something to the pistol thing, though. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it seems to me as though I have seen, Rube, you, you've been around even more shooters than I have. Tucker, you too. Let me know if you guys think that this is correct or wrong. Uh, I've seen a lot of people who can shoot precision rifle, maybe even some carbine. They struggle with the pistol. But I have yet to see many people who are really proficient with a pistol who don't very easily at least pick up really quickly the precision rifle or the carbine. Yeah. I'm thinking in like a guy like Nils, right? Like Yeah. Uh there's a guy that we shoot with quite a bit. His name's Nils Jonasson and he's one of the best pistol shooters in the country. He just won ch- national championship yesterday. So, there Tal- you go. Talladega. <laughs> uh, and yeah. and um but that guy can show up to a three gun match and win an AK match and win. Yeah. A PCC match and win, and it's like I think when, so the like Tucker said, I think a lot of firearm shooting breaks down into a sight picture and a trigger press, yeah. and and understanding that you want a trigger press that doesn't disturb disturb your sight picture, and you have to know what your sight picture is, like what an acceptable sight picture is for that target that you're shooting, and the people who get that the fastest are the ones that I think typically shoot a lot of pistol. Because they just because, there's no aids like in and, terms of what helps you do that. There's no bipod. There's, there's no also rock. not a lot of external stimuluses that are going to affect you in a pistol competition. So mm. if you're shooting rifle and you're talking about wind, okay, or, or the weather, those are all things that can drastically affect. If you had a good sight uh, picture in a trigger press, but you didn't know what the wind was, right, not going to hit the target. Whereas there's a lot of uh, there's not really a, a way to get around. You can't really fudge the numbers in a pistol shooting like scenario. It's it, it was yeah. what it was or it wasn't. If you missed, it was your fault. You can't say I yeah, win or yeah. It wasn't typically like oh, I must have had a hot batch of primers. Like no, that didn't. That's not why you missed the eight inch steel <laughs> at ten yards. I'm <laughs> uh, sorry, but uh, and that's you know Adam Maxwell and and I get to work with a lot of um, our great customers down at the range or out in the field. And when we're talking about shooting red dots on a pistol it's one of the easiest things is to be like 
uh, when red dots got introduced into the pistol game, there are no hard pistol shots anymore. There are bad trigger presses. Bad trigger presses, yeah. Because I mean, uh, when, that's when it, the only thing. Yeah, because <laughs> like, basically the red dot is is a good training aid in a lot of situations. Because I mean, when you jerk the trigger, you will see the dot jump. Yeah. But yeah. kind of getting back to your original comment there, as far as pistol versus rifle, the big thing, in my opinion, is the pistol. You have one, two, two points of contact, and rifle you have three, right? So you have your shoulder to stabilize all that, and it's really easy to to pull the trigger without moving in comparison to two hands two feet out from your body. You know. Yeah. What I mean? So yeah. I think that's why it's easier to jump from one to the other than, than vice versa. I don't know how the, the right way to say it, but like the pistol demands the most fundamentals, yeah, I think, that, to shoot it. at a high level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where, like for me, and I'm not by, not, by no means am I the example of, you know, shooting performance, but I have gotten to a, a level where I'm pretty proficient in a lot of different disciplines. Um, the I started with pistol. Yeah. Um, because I grew up hunting and so you know shooting a rifle um hunting western states that was kind of it was like i had a lot of practice doing it and i practiced a lot to do that so that i'd be a good hunter uh and then shotgun shooting being born and raised in the midwest and shooting trap on wednesday night and skeet on thursday night and duck hunting on the weekends like you get a lot of shotgun practice oh yeah pistol was a place where i didn't I didn't grow up like actively shooting yeah. a pistol. So when I got invited to my first USPSA match by a friend of mine, it was like, uh, I was like, cool. Yeah. This is something I don't have a lot of practice in. And yeah, I mean, I would, you would, I would take, I would take my, my pistol back to the dump on the property and shoot at some, you know, bottles and cans and, you know, bowling yeah. pins. But that was my extent of my practice. And then when I got there, I, I hate being bad at something. So I was like, well, I have to do this now because <laughs> that's can't a lot of work. Yeah. That's my problem. So, <laughs> so yeah. Right on. Yeah, absolutely. But that's, I think, where a lot of people get their start in competitive shooting is pistol because it's usually a weak point for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does really work the fundamentals of the actual shot mm-hmm. quite a bit. And it's, I, I'd never really... I don't know why I didn't think of it because you think of it just naturally every time you go up to the firing line, depending on what gun you're shooting. But like the fact that, yeah, you're shooting a rifle. Let's say you got three points of contact. You got a bipod out in front of you. If it's a precision rifle, you're on some sort of a rest. That's really nice. But then you do have the added in external factors. So there's different things that those guys are thinking about. And it's kind of nice. I mean, if you think about like if you had to shoot precision rifle and and shoot it the way that you have to shoot a pistol with just how fundamentally sound you have to be and think about wind and mirage and ballistics and all this stuff that can be changed. I mean, that would make it like, I mean, at that point, I have seen, I have unreal. seen high level pistol shooters go or high level three gunners go into long range and like they do everything right. The shot just, hit off the right edge. Well, you <laughs> so got to learn, you gotta learn, the, you gotta learn the other hard part, right? Yeah. So, I mean, by no means is shooting a rifle easy, and you do have to be technically sound. I think as far as getting the basics down on a rifle, it's definitely easier, but to master it and to hit tiny targets far away in adverse conditions is definitely, yeah. it's a challenge in its own right. And they do, and they do up the ante with the barricades and things that you have right, to shoot yeah. off of a lot. Correct. I mean, it, it's, to your point, like you said, you absolutely have to still be fundamentally sound. Correct. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes, I mean, we were just doing some practicing out. Mark and I were, were thinking about shooting. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. A match and, uh, PRS match? PRS match. Nice. And we were out doing some shooting and we were off of, uh, oh shoot. What are they? Just some various different barricades. Yeah, and props and yeah, it's positional pretty, stuff. It, it does. It challenges you. Because oh, when you're just different. shooting prone, like I said, you know, off a of bipod or something, you're just, ah, watch me ring that 300 still. Watch me yeah. ring the 400. You, you can just kind of get out there and show off a little bit. But yeah. when you do those little, add in those little change-ups, you're like, I'm I'm uncomfortable. I can't figure yeah. out what's going on. You start missing it, you know, 300 yards, which isn't a cakewalk, but it, it normally when you're just calm and shooting off a bench, you're just ringing yeah, it over right. and over. It's pretty wild. Yeah, shooting a thousand yards off a fence post, you know, in the wind with one bag. I mean that I mean it's a whole different thing than land prone and shooting whatever it is you're shooting. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's a whole lot of difficulty and, and they challenge you in different ways. Absolutely. So uh definitely each has their own challenges, I guess. Yeah, yeah even in you know, and from a thirty thousand foot view, if uh if I said, Hey, do you think shooting steel with a shotgun would be difficult? And you'd be like, No, it's a shotgun and it's steel. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, they're gonna take a little no shoot like that and put it right in front of right. your target and you have <laughs> now you have a two inch little sliver of a target to hit at twenty yards with you know And you have to do it fast. And you have to do it fast, right? So 
this is not again not something to go off track but speed and time yeah. is always the factor right. that can you do this yeah i can do it can you, okay, do, it can you do it in an hour <laughs> you can, can you do it in yeah. a minute you yeah. can take pretty much anything and make it pretty tough i mean imagine <laughs> right. trying to pour cereal in the morning but they're shooting at you like it, it just gets hard <laughs> you might miss the bowl oh yeah um, I've yeah. never tried or driving, that. right? Like, can you drive on this track? Yeah, I can drive on this track. Can you do it 180 miles an hour for three <laughs> hours? No. <laughs> Correct. Um, we should try that. That would be fun. While shooting. Okay. Well, now we got a sport. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, man. So when it comes to, uh, is, so the PRS, the long distance shooting, that's been your kind of latest venture, right? No, I, I just, I actually just got here today. I flew straight okay. from... Alabama Nationals, uh, shooting production Nationals, which is outside of my element. I'm usually an open shooter, uh, high cap, red dot, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I really shoot all three pretty much throughout the year. Uh, some some get more focused than others at a certain time of year, but I, I try to keep it pretty balanced throughout the year pretty much. Okay. You're, um, in terms of, like, which sport have you been doing the longest? And then uh, The ones? longest is, is USPSA and three gun by far. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, those two, I mean, within a couple months of each other kind of started. And, and I, I, I believe that USPSA and three gun, they really feed each other well. I mean, same movements, you know, obviously there's only a pistol in one, but you learn a lot of the movements and as far as how to move with a firearm. Um, that's a big part as well. Safety rules and stuff. All like the safety. That. I mean, obviously. Yeah. So those two, they, they cross over pretty well. Precision rifles quite a bit different, but you're shooting a gun and you know, that I think crosses over throughout. Yeah, what's your uh, what's your favorite part about each different style of competition that you that you do? So like PRS is to me is like more a cerebral sport, right? You got to be like mentally tuned, mentally sharp for the entire match. You can get a little sloppy and and the other, you know, obviously there's a big mental game to it, but uh, it's a more mental than physical in my opinion. You know, you have to be sharp twenty four seven. One bad trigger pull, you can lose the match or drop five places by one point. Um, hmm. And then you know. The action shooting, like I grew up competing in baseball, pretty high level of that, and just competing wakeboarding. I rode professionally for a few years when I was young. Um, I just like to compete in anything, and this was kind of the segue to to compete as an older gentleman, not quite old, but older for sure, um, and and still compete at a high level and really really try to achieve you know an elite status in, in some of these games. And I think uh, that athleticism involved in USPSA and three gun kind of kind of gives me that fulfillment. Is yeah. really it. Yeah. I like how he calls himself an older gentleman. <laughs> older gentleman. Not old. <laughs> when I hit 50, then I will just drop the ER. <laughs> I, I figured, this is a couple of years ago, but I figured I figured you at like 31. 40. I just turned 40, dude. My stunning good looks keep me 30. You do. You look good for 40. I appreciate that. You too, sir. It's you're, all the shit. You're not 40, Well, though. I'm not 40. So, <laughs> <No>. but, easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, not old. Let's get that. No. I mean, hey. He's still, he's, still, he's still a young buck. <sighs> But uh, it must be all that shooting. I like that. That's got to do it. Yeah. Um, how about uh, how about for somebody new who's listening and they want to get into uh, one of these styles? I mean, you kind of mentioned like a good good route to go, um, starting up locally, finding a club, just getting involved in whatever yeah. they, they're in. I mean, in a ton of people these days now, especially after buying like a gajillion guns lately, a lot of people have the pistol. We talked about that. But like... Uh, Let's say with what I feel is one of the hotter ones, like the uh, the long range precision stuff. What uh, what do you tell somebody who's trying to get into that? Like, okay, so I mean, it it's it's a very specific type of firearm, right? To, to 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 be able to shoot that far at a mile, but you don't have to start with that, right? Like, I mean, you have guns that do this. I'm sure you do, and and I do as well. Like, but everybody's got a thirty odd six or a three oh eight or something like that. So a lot of people will just bring that to the match their first time and then of course everybody has tripods you know optics bags all the things that you need to compete so really you come to a match with a with a bipod and a rifle and a little bit of ammo you will be able to shoot and successfully complete the match and kind of go from there you know what your budget will allow and then you know obviously what your time and other resources will allow you to do is kind of how far you want to get into it. But I mean, yeah. people are super friendly and, and it's the same thing. So basically get on, you know, the PRS and RL websites and kind of find these matches. They're all listed. Mm. Very easy to find, very easy to locate. You can reach out to me. Or I'm sure one of you guys and uh, just kind of ask the question, like, how do I, how do I do this? You know? And uh, I, I think that's probably the easiest way is to Google one of those websites and just kind of do some research, find out what's local to you. Yeah. 
yeah, anyway, you can do the, uh, you can get used to what the rules and all that stuff are going to be when you, before you get in. Yeah, I, mean, I, know, I know NRL does a really good job of vi- uh, video and film. Yeah, and there's a, it's a Excalibur uh, Productions, or X, just search Excalibur NRL on, um, on YouTube, and there's a million videos out there. Also, they do something called the Guardian series. I haven't personally done that, but I, I think it's, I don't know if it's like a pro-am format or if it's like, it's basically trying to get amateurs into the game. And, and then on the PRS side, uh, in October, there's something called the Gap Grind. Basically, it's a true 100% uh, pro-am format where like I could get a brand new guy or a guy that's maybe shot a match or two and we would team up. Basically, I would shoot first. Nobody gets, I don't get corrections or anything like that, obviously. I put my stuff down. They then step up and then I can like coach them through their entire mm-hmm. run and basically get them kind of accustomed to to shooting mm-hmm. so both of those are great ways for a new guy and there's a lot of guys so you don't have to have it? a what was like uh, your first match for, uh, as far Altus, as PRS? Altus down yeah. in florida yeah i i had a couple buddies that were local um i shot a couple local matches by me and they were like well you should come up to altus and that's kind of when i got into it again gotcha. you know kind of oh, found cool. out the deal how do you do your how do you do your training when you have so many different types of competition that you're involved in? That's kind of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> if I was a smart man, I'd probably just do one and just stick with it like a lot of guys do, but I like to keep it fresh and uh it keeps things from kind of getting stale sometimes. And uh but really, I mean b- before something's coming up, that that's what I focus on, right? Like so 2 weeks out, 3 weeks out, I just kind of do all that if possible and then just kind of push it till till it's time to go and then yeah, head out and then on to the next one, you know. What uh like what types of things help you train for an upcoming match the best? Is it just do you go out and do you s- try and set up mock stages for yourself, or are you going out and you're working on just the fundamentals? Are you going out like timing yourself to work on dealing with some stress of time, or or what's yeah a, a little bit of pretty much all that. So I mean, if it's PRS, right? Like so, thirty minutes from my house, a buddy of mine bought a range, Volusia County Gun and Hunt Club. We run, I run the local match there every other month, uh, PRS. So I mean, I can pretty much use that at my leisure. So I'll go out there and run stages. If there's something I'm having a problem with, like say a, a rooftop or whatever it is, basically I'll focus on that. Like okay, I had some issues getting stable on that rooftop at wherever. I'm going to play on the roof, you know, shoot 50 to 100 rounds and feel comfortable doing it. And then I'll move on to something else. But sometimes I'll just go and I'll have the, like an old, ma- old uh, matchbook or basically what the stages were. And I'll just go shoot the match, you know, and I'll kind of write down notes and keep, keep track yeah. of what I need. But in pistol or three gun, like three gun especially, I focus on usually like one type of firearm. I really need to kind of sharpen the skills on. Okay. Um, but, you know, you always have to bring them all to kind of check zero, make sure everything's functioning, clean, all that. But in pistol, um, yeah, a, a few small drills and then sometimes complete stages. I try to change it each time because in a match, you're not going to be able to just do the same thing over and over again. You're going to get one chance to do it, do it right. So I'll, like, have, you know, eight different targets out there, and I'll, I'll say, okay, I'm going to shoot this one, this one, move here, shoot these two. And then the next time I'll, I'll change that up to keep it more – uh, kind of emulating a match setting, you know, because you get one chance to do it, you don't get redos. So that's kind of I try to keep it kind of realistic in that in that what's sense. Your, what's your motivation in like in shooting sports versus? So we'll take like situation A where a person says, "Oh, it's a fun way to spend a Saturday," mm, <laughs> and yeah. situation B where it's like, "I'm going to train for three weeks before this thing." Right. Like, what's your goals and what what are your motivations and that keep you trying to perform at a high level? Yeah, yeah. I, I ask myself that sometimes. I, I really don't know what it is. It's just the way I was kind of wired and built. Like I want to win. I want to be the best, and I, I want to beat the guys that have been the best. You know, and and that's really what it is. And and the cool thing is, you can have guys like me or you or other guys or guys that just want to come hang out with their buddies. I mean, and that's the cool thing is those guys might be on the very same squad. You might be sitting with like the best shooter in the world next to you or Jerry or any of the old mm-hmm. guys that nope, any of the more seasoned veterans there you go. <laughs> in the game that are still very very good and uh it's it's, it's just a great community and, that, and that's i think the part that keeps people around is like you meet some of the some of the best friends and longest lasting relationships of like-minded people that just enjoy each other's company and uh that that's that's part of it for sure how are you making time for all that my wife's nice she lets me <laughs> she's she's forgiving me. She, she gets me right like she knows like i always have to be doing something even when i'm home like I don't I don't sit down too often like I'm always up doing something that's just kind of how I'm wired. Yeah. I just I just never been like the sit still and watch TV type. You get her so, into it at all? I've tried. She's just she doesn't love it. She'll come out and shoot with me, you know what I mean? Cool. But she's not into like the competition yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So I have a I have a interesting one here. So how long if you're so you're shooting at a high level in USPSA, right? Yeah. You're shooting at a GM, a GM level. GM, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty high. It's as high as you can go. <laughs> Grandmaster, um, correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah nice. right. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then in three gun, same yeah. same place. Like yeah. you're you're in in the mix to win usually. In the mix, yeah. I want to be the guy that they're looking at like this guy's gonna win. Yeah. You know, like Horner or, or Nils or, or yeah. guys like that. You know, and that, okay, that's so, really the goal. So if you had to say like, how long did it take you from when you started shooting USPSA to a GM level, or when you started shooting three gun to uh, winning a match level? So p- pistol took the longest. Um, I'm, I basically just made GM like earlier this year. Mm-hmm. So I was a pretty competitive master for a long time. And, and I, I beat a lot of GMs along the way. But as far as like I just shot area six a couple months ago or a month ago, I finished like 96%, which is like a GM finish. Yeah. And, and I, it's easy to, well, it's not easy, but it's easier to get the classification than it is to actually finish that sure. in a major match. Right. Yep. Cause it's, all the best guys and all that, but it was about six years, um, six or seven years in USPSA and about two or three and three gun and about one or two in PRS. I was going to say, I remember last spring, uh, getting a lot of text messages about the PRS leaderboard and for <laughs> about four months, there was this guy sitting on the top that just came in from USPSA. Yeah. Some random three gun guy. Yeah. So what, what, <laughs> what about all the other stuff you did helped you flatten that learning curve i think just understanding firearms in general and, and how to use them how to clean them how to shoot them fast and, and really just the basic fundamentals of firearm shooting i mean they're, sure. they're the same for every gun you know yeah steady sights aim trigger pull all, i mean all that stuff kind of goes across all platforms what's the thing that trips you up the most when you switch from one to the other honestly like now it, it's really probably it's just, it's just it executing really the wrong ammo yeah, yeah, that would do it. But I mean, just <laughs> executing on the proper day. I mean, it's really what it comes down to: being mentally sharp for the entirety of the match, and uh, really just not having mistakes. Because in this game, the hardest thing to achieve is consistency. Yeah. I mean, it takes guys years. Some guys never figure it out. I mean, that's the deal: consistent and elite for all weekend is, yeah. is the goal. You ever have an epiphany while you're out shooting one type of firearm, and you're like, "Oh, this is what I'm doing wrong with my." You know, you're shooting bolt gun. You know, this is what I'm doing wrong with my pistol. You're shooting pistol. You're like, oh, that's what I need to do with Hmm. the rifle or the shotgun or the AR or whatever. It's a good question. I I don't think it's been like shooting one epiphany. Okay, that's going to be help here. I think I just focus on like the one I got and then. And then maybe carry those skills across. That's a good question. I mean, if I think about it, maybe. But uh, yeah, not not yeah. not to my understanding. Like specifically, go to. Oh, I need to do that here, right? Yeah, yeah. I know we were. Uh, this is unrelated to the firearm shooting sports, but still a shooting sport of archery. We were talking to a uh, to a guy. It's going to be part of a, a pod venture that we have coming up here where we were shooting bows. And he started getting into describing how to shoot a bow really well. And basically everything he was saying, it, it was almost like if I would have closed my eyes, I would have thought I was in a pistol class same down thing. here at Vortex Edge. Mm, it's the I mean, same thing. I mean, because it was just like, make sure you've got, you know, your sights on and it's all about releasing the arrow without influencing the bow. And yeah. I mean, like all this stuff that he was going into, I'm like, it's word for word. Just substitute out the word bow for pistol, and or it was trigger almost, or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Exa- yeah it's all the same all that stuff. I think you can. I had a bit of an epiphany there, and yeah. then it was kind of it actually sort of helped in as I was trying to shoot a bow better. Which yeah, is interesting. Yeah, I think that's the same thing. I think sometimes, like, I use this one a lot, but I think sometimes simplicity can be offensive, right? Especially yeah. if you have a lot of <laughs> a lot invested into learning something or a lot of money invested into certain guns, yeah. and all of a sudden somebody like Jerry comes along and says, "Well, you just." Just pull the Aim trigger. the gun and pull the trigger. And it's like, <laughs> no, it's not that. What, what are you not telling me? Yeah, right. And then right. I, I've learned recently and kind of I've been putting a lot of more effort into my shooting and, and you know, taking care of myself physically and all that stuff just to be a you know better dad, better athlete, better at work. And um, I think it is pretty simple. Like, I've gotten to the point yeah. where it's like, don't overcomplicate the thing. And I think when you look at – when I look at somebody like Tucker who can – seemingly and again this can be frustrating to watch but seemingly get off the plane from uspsa nationals and go shoot and win a three-gun match the next weekend and then goes and shoots a prs match and then everybody's talking about it it's like and then you ask him and he's like well, you just aim the gun and pull the trigger it's like <laughs> yeah sometimes i think it is simple and like it you know learning this stuff does actually take time and take like you have to go down all these rabbit trails but then you get to come back to the main road which is just well, performance yeah. It's because you have, I mean, it's the classic, 
Uh, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, yeah. and then conscious competence, yeah, unconscious subconscious, all that yep. stuff, right? I mean, when you're unconsciously incompetent, you're like, I don't get it. What's so hard about it? It's easy, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, yeah, like you said, you then go to, now I'm consciously incompetent. You're like, wow, there's a lot to this. It's quite complicated. Yeah. Then you start figuring those things out. And you're like, well, I know all these things are very complicated. I'm able to do it now, but I still can't do it fast or just intuitively. Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden it goes back to just, wow, like I got all that stuff down. It's subconscious. And now it's really simple again. Yeah. If anybody listening wants to read books and really go down rabbit trails on that stuff, uh, with Winning in Mind, uh, The Talent Code, those are a couple of books yeah. that are just like yeah. crazy, yeah. crazy in depth. I feel like there's, with people though there's personalities tucker you're probably one of these kinds of personalities where i think there's a lot of people who like being in the conscious part of like mm-hmm. conscious either conscious incompetence or competence control freaks yep because they're always you know it's it's you even were describing it basically i mean you wanted to keep trying something new like you can't sit still you're yeah. always wanted to yep. be challenged and and get into something because if you're always unconsciously competent or whatever I mean, you're always just sort of cruising along. You're the guy who's always shooting alphas with a pistol. Right. But you're never getting any faster. You just go in, you're like, yeah, yeah, bang, 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 bang. Look, they're all alphas. All right, you I'm going to get, get a burger now. You get that a lot, like the plateau. Right? Yeah. And I had a buddy this weekend. He's like, the last three years, I've been in the exact same place at Nationals. I'm like, well, I mean, that's part of it. The only way to get around it is keep doing it. Right. You know? Because as soon as you start missing again, yeah. you know, it's it's it feels so comfortable when you're Shooting what you're like, I finally got through all that stuff, and now I'm at a level where at least I don't suck or yeah, something. Yeah, well, like, like early in the days, right? Like I would shoot a USPSA match, and this was only the two at the time, and, I, and I'd be like, I'm done with this. Like I'm going to go back to three gun. You know, and I'd get like kicked down and beat down a little bit, and then, I, you know, I'd go over here, and I'd forget all about that, and then when I came back, I mean, it was all good. Just keep at it, you know, and, and that I remember doing that a few times back in the day, you know, yeah. and now I obviously don't really have to deal with that quite as much. But uh, I remember I remember going through that quite a lot back then. It can yeah. be hard to do that too, especially when you're used to either winning or performing at a high level or doing something well, and then you go and do something that you suck at. Yeah. And it's really hard pill to swallow. But like, in in reality, your brain actually doesn't learn anything unless it's being challenged. Right. Yeah. Right. You don't actually That's get true. better unless you are at a point where you realize that you suck at it. Yeah. Like in in different varying levels of skill, but like that's how you learn how to walk is by falling. That's how you learn how to run is by, you know, stumbling and tripping. Like, yeah. that's how muscles grow is by exercising them and doing things and pushing them to a level where they can't perform anymore. Yeah. That's why we offer, I brought it up a couple of times here. It's because it's exciting and new for us, but Vortex Edge, their training division mm-hmm. here at Vortex, that's why we have a class of uh, video diagnostics where we film you at high speed doing various different pistol manipulations and that's shooting. That's cool. I didn't know that. And then you can go back and you can break something down because it's, it's for the person who actually, <laughs> they kind of want to spend a day getting torn apart a little bit. Well, that's what you do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, you're going to get watched at like, oh, look at how long it's taking you to acquire the sights before you pull the trigger and like you're seeing it in slow motion. You're like, it's taking me forever when in reality it's like you know point yeah, seconds or something tens, like yeah. that right yeah but but it makes a big difference in the grand scheme of thing it's for people who are are like well i'm comfortable but actually the fact that i'm comfortable makes me uncomfortable i want to keep getting better like yeah. i'm gonna get bored mm-hmm. you gotta push something. the threshold yeah. and no matter what it is i mean it, i i push to the threshold of missing and then you know I'll, I'll tone it back a bit and try to get some consistency before a match starts and you got to know where the threshold is in order to break through it right yeah <laughs> yeah do you uh do you get the sense um I've experienced this. I don't know if it's like if it's real or if it's perceived or what. Um, obviously, when you're in a competition, you actually get to see your final numbers or your standing. It's, right. It makes it a bit more real if it is a thing. But uh, I'll have times where like I like multiple different sports, and uh, you know maybe one of them uh, I can't really do in the win in, during the winter time. So then summer comes back around, and I get back into it for the first time. And I haven't been doing it for a long yeah. time. I've at least been staying in shape. And I get back into it for the first time, and I'm, like, randomly really good at it. Yeah. That beginner's luck all over again sort of saying. <laughs> and uh, and I'm like, this is great. And then a week goes by, and I'm oh. back to, like, yeah, now all of a sudden I suck <laughs> at it again. I'm like, well, wait, what happened? I was, like, super good there for a week. Um, I can explain that for that, you if you want. Tell me, tell me about beginners. Like, <laughs> does it have to do with what we were just talking about? I feel like, or what? It has to do Far with away. A, has to do with a little thing in your brain that insulates neural pathways called myelin. 
and basically, Jeez, look at you. I'm gonna get told up. you he's a smart guy. Med so, school degree here. so when you learn how to do something, you have that aha aha moment, or you you learn how to do something, and it becomes like you know we'll call it second nature. That's subconscious yeah. skill, right? So you build that, and every time you do that, whether you're walking or you're talking or you're throwing a baseball or a football or you're shooting a gun, every time you have something and you do it well, that that neural pathway gets wrapped in this substance called myelin, and basically. Uh, if you can imagine that when your brain decides it wants to do something like lift a cup up or whatever, it has to send an impulse and that's an electrical impulse. And so as that travels through your brain to the correct portion to tell whatever muscle to do that, basically, um, an uninsulated neural pathway is going to have a uh, loss of that signal or okay. loss of that, that strength of that, um, basically that, that impulse. And as we insulate that pathway, this is again I'm not a neural doctor. We know. Could have fooled me. You're doing yeah, great. Well, I know. You're doing I great. come across as that a lot of times. People <laughs> ask me if I am. Uh, but as we insulate that, now we make that signal more efficient and and faster. Okay. Uh, and so when you go into doing something like this, will happen a lot. I'll shoot three gun all summer, and then I'll go back to USPSA league. When, like Tucker says, it gets really cold here uh, in October. AKA okay, so cold. 60. Yeah, <laughs> AKA it's like 55. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go shoot USPSA League. And because um, again, not it's indoors, so it's something that in the winter we can do that up here. That sounds cool. Right? I'd like to do that indoors and in I'm the like, summer. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Right. I haven't done this all year, so I'm just going to go. I'm just going to do the thing. And all of a sudden you look and you're like, whoa, like I, got I, I won. Like, and I wasn't even trying. Well, it's because we're letting our body know do what it knows how to do. How did the myelin come into this? Well, myelin um, can it go away though? Because I feel like if you're, if you've built up this really efficient uh, insulated neuro stream or something, does it funny does it you should ask degrade over uh, time? It and can. Then- uh, typically, when you learn something, that myelin or myelination of that um, synapse or that pathway will last. Uh, years and years. Uh, it doesn't really start to degrade until you get into your 50s, usually. At which point, oh. um, a lot of things that are like uh, subconscious skill, uh, that'll last for years and years. And then when you get into your 50s, you have to start doing it more to maintain that. But um, there's a there's a ton of research going into how to grow myelin faster, how to, you know... Um, Insulate I mean, neural pathways that. What s- foods are they suggesting you eat? And always ask. No, 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 no. Uh, there's actually not too much in that. Trust me. I would. We've I been would. Looking, huh? <laughs> I've been looking. I right? like. Hopefully, it's venison, kale. elk tenderloin, there you and go. stuff like that. <laughs> but I'm guess guaranteeing it's not. Lima beans. Um, but no, there's a uh, there's a book that I'm reading right now that talks about that. So that's why it's, it's fresh in my head. Yeah. But yeah, that's when you when you're not actually trying to do something when you just l- rely on your. Um, subconscious skill, that's when it comes out. Well, yeah. a lot of the guys, like, you know, I know JJ spoke about it and other guys, uh, it's basically like when they're shooting, right? You program your brain the stage before, and when you're shooting it, it's like an unconscious effort at that point, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. you, pr- you program the data, and then you push enter and psh, let it go, you know? Yeah. I know a lot of athletes will say, though, like, if they're ever reaching a plateau or they're reaching a point where they just feel like they're hitting their head against the ceiling as they're trying to improve, they'll actually just go and try it. And they'll just do something else yeah. for a little while. Yeah, that's, that's what I was kind of doing, right? Yeah, kinda I mean, you get mold, to do that. Come all, back and do it again. Yeah, you yeah. get to do that kind of all the time if you're going in so many different shooting disciplines. Yeah. You get to be like, ah, PRS is pissing me off right now. I'm going to go shoot USPSA. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you come back and you're like, you just get a fresh restart when you're able to right. come back. Sometimes, and this again goes back to something I'm not an expert on, but I can translate that into <laughs> physically what's happening. Um, watch, we're going to have somebody listening that's like a myelin specialist. Like, oh, actually. Uh, but, um, <laughs> so it's it's like you can, <laughs> you can stand in your driveway and shoot free throws or, you know, try and throw a curveball like yeah. all afternoon and you just can't get it and then you come back the next day and it's there. Yeah. That's because that takes a little bit of time to build that process in your head. Yeah. It does. And I've found the same thing. I've found that like I can go and try and uh stick a reload like, you know, you set you set your par time to whatever under right. a second, you know, point nine, point eight, whatever, and you can't get it and you just practice and practice and practice and you've failed fifty times, a hundred times, and you come back the next day and you get it the first time. Yeah. And that's that's like a lot of things in life is like it takes a lot of failure. Like you're not you're not learning how not to you're not learning how to do something. You're learning how not to do it and you're li- 
eliminating all that stuff. And then when you come back and try it again, all of a sudden it's there because now, now you know what to do, you know what not to do. And so when you just do it, it's, it's there. Yeah. Well, and failure helps too, but it also can screw you up at times because if you screw up, like I'm going in my head and I'm thinking about, I've gotten into boxing lately. Oh boy. When I say lately, I've actually been doing it for like two years, but lately I've been starting to do sparring, right? Mm. And you get in the ring and it's like, of course, the first time you do any sort of sparring and you're actually fighting somebody else, you're like, oh my gosh, everything that I learned is now out the window. Like it, just this guy's trying to punch me in the face. Yeah. Um, you know, you get punched in the face a lot when you first do it. Like, yeah. Regardless of who you are, you get punched in the face a lot. And uh, so every time then, that's like, we'll call that like a failure. Every time then you actually are getting physically hurt and it doesn't feel good. And then you get out of the ring and your nose gets swollen up and it's hard to breathe. And you're like, this sucks. <laughs> and then I, like, there was a period of time where I was like, I was having a hard time learning more in the ring because I was always afraid of getting punched in the face. So I took a couple of weeks off because I had to get breathing capability back in my nose. And uh, <laughs> after that couple Sounds of weeks. Sounds miserable, just by the way. Just a yeah. little bit. But after that couple of weeks, I was like, I got to get back in there. Like, I can't just sit out like this is too fun uh, in a weird way, I guess, because I, what I described didn't sound fun. But I was like, get got to get back in there. But the couple of weeks had allowed my brain to forget what pu getting punched in the face, kind of like how much it sucked. So then when I got back in the ring, I was like way more relaxed and it was so much better. Right. Hmm. And I didn't screw up and I actually didn't get punched in the face as much. <laughs> and so it's like sometimes, too, you have to step away from screwing up all the time because if your brain is always like, every time I screw up, get back to shooting. Everybody like, takes breaks. Every That's time, normal. Yeah, every time yeah. I screw up, like I don't hear somebody say impact. I see a big thud of dirt to the side of the target, you know, whatever. I'm just getting this like negative feeling every like whatever thing gets released in your brain every time something negative happens you're like that happens every time so then you just think of you get to the range and you're already just anticipating like missing or something mm -hmm. but if you take some time off then your brain kind of just forgets that and then next time you go out to the range you can just feel a little bit more free of that like yeah that weight. I, I think breaks are good from time to time when you get frustrated like you were saying you miss 50 to 100 reels at a time you know take a break come back the next day next week whatever and, and get back at it and mm -hmm. uh like you said you'll forget that and hope, yeah. hopefully carry on yeah and dry fire you know i i kind of follow steve anderson method of dry fire and like that that whole thing is like setting your part timer at a time that's shorter than you can do it yeah so i mean the whole time you're doing mm -hmm. it you're trying to do it you're actually trying to fail. Like you're trying yeah. to set the timer at a time that's faster or less time than it takes you to do that skill. Yep, I think that's good. I mean, you don't find the point where you're like, oh, this is easy. I can do this all day and then I'm going to practice. Because that's, that's what you're going to get better at then is the thing you're already good at. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's true. How about, uh, how about your physical fitness with all this competition shooting that you're doing? Do you get your workout in a given day? Let's say, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I got to go to the gym, got to get a workout in. Do you get your workout in from doing shooting stuff or do yeah. you also have to supplement it with hitting the gym? I used to go to the gym a lot. I've actually got some elbow stuff I need kind of fixed right now, so I can't do much lifting. I can still do cardio stuff, but honestly, I just haven't. So basically what I'm getting uh, like physically fitness-wise fitness, fitness -wise, is uh, basically on the range, on the range or working and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so no gym for me. So it's, it keeps you in shape. I mean, yeah. obviously you got to eat healthy and kind of watch what you put in your mouth in the kitchen. But other than that, I mean, it, it's a good form of exercise. It is. What do you think is the, uh, what's your favorite, uh, or not favorite, but like, what do you feel like gets the best workout in? I think probably three gun. Uh, yeah. USPSA and three gun are very similar, but three gun stages are a lot longer. And, and, and the reset every single time is a whole lot longer. So every yeah. time the, the shooter finishes, you got to go out there, reset the target. Get your steps in. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> right. And sometimes you're, you know, climbing up rocks, up and down hills and, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of, so it is a form of exercise. I mean, if you want to be an extreme athlete, I don't recommend this is the only thing you do, but, uh, it, sure. it will keep you in some sort of shape for sure. Sure. Yeah. I bet you wakeboarding, professional wakeboarding, that probably kept was, in shape. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was in really good shape then. How's that for a workout? Yeah, man. yeah. I went, uh, I went out with a buddy, my buddy Adam, over in uh, Orlando a couple weeks ago. Oh, actually, it was probably a few months ago now. I was sore for like a week, and I went out like Ooh. for 15 minutes. <laughs> I used to go out for like 15 minutes, like six, seven times a day, and just no problem. Yeah, getting old takes a toll on you. Not older. as spunky as we once were. Older, older, Not older. Just that's just right. That. That's yeah. right. Yeah, forgot that for a sec. Yep. Rube, you do a lot of yeah. different kinds of shooting too. Mm -hmm. Which ones do you do? Um, well, 
Probably too many. Uh, but like recreationally, just uh, I guess I'm not trying to be competitive at uh, shooting trap or skeet uh, or like uh, some, you know, like rimfire stuff. I'm not super concerned mm-hmm. about that, about the, the where I finish in that. Um, competitively, actual, like really like putting effort into it would be uh, USPSA three gun uh, and then variants of that. So single gun disciplines oh, yeah, yeah. like PCC or uh, I shoot uh, usually two to three AK style carbine matches a I heard year. you may have a few pistols coming. Yeah. For yeah. USPSA. Yes, yeah, sir. Yep. <laughs> nice. A few. Um, you can only shoot one at a time, right? Well, at least one. But yeah, you have to have a backup. No. Yeah, so so definitely. Um, Especially if you're Eric. Yeah, right. Forgets his pistol forgets all the time. It, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I guess, and, and then like you know, when we had the Vortex Extreme, I got into that stuff and got the yeah. rifles set up for that, and then, um, you know, really, really recreationally, we'll go and and play in the PRS side of things locally. Um, not as much the last couple of years, but previous to that, I did quite a bit. Um, yeah, and then just uh, Steel Challenge. What are you gonna try and get Tucker into next? What's your next thing? You know, a buddy of mine, actually, uh, Jason Spradling from Federal, we were rooming together at this last house, and he's like, well, if you got a shotgun, bring it out, because there's a cool sporting clay course. So I, I traded something I had for a, you know, a shotgun. It was obviously the wrong kind of shotgun, but we went out and shot, and he, he, he beat me for a few days. So I may play with that just a little bit. But sporting I, clays I, is yeah. a lot of fun. Uh, so I think I'm going to – I was just looking on the airplane and right over here uh, – a few sporting clays guns. I'm, I'm probably going to get a 32 inch gun for shooting some sporting clays and just recreational, like he was. So saying. that's I'm not going to get crazy into it. Of course, I've said that before. I was about to say so that seems knows? to be what it takes to uh, get you into something yeah. is you get beat in it and you're like. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not going to like toot my horn this, but like I'll go and shoot trap and skeet and I'll shoot 23s and 24s. Yeah, Midwest all guys day. can shoot shotguns all day. I that's know, a thing. I don't know what that uh, is. Out of 25, I'm a Midwest guy. Okay. Got and it. but but a lot of people can do that. That's okay. not necessarily super special. It's getting to your twenty third, twenty fourth clay, and not missing that last one because you're like, I'm gonna shoot a perfect game. This is uh, this is this is awesome. So I think I haven't been willing to invest the uh, mental fortitude and training to get to that level where I really put in the time. Yeah. Um, sporting clays, skeet, trap are all. Um, you know, not necessarily really expensive sports to get into. And I mean, if you go and on a Saturday, you shoot, you know, eight boxes or six rounds or whatever, you're, yeah. you're only going to spend 50, 60 bucks on ammo. Not like shooting a three gun match where you're going to spend four hundred, five hundred dollars on ammo at a big match on a weekend. Yeah. Uh, but but definitely um, I've gone and shot and over like my whole life have shot the shotgun sports. I just haven't, it doesn't have the physical aspect. Now it has a really strong mental like requirement. So if I had to like give you a peek into what I'm thinking about, I'm saving those for one. (laughs) Physically, I'm not able to run (laughs) and jump. I'm saving those ones. I can, I'm like, I can do that when I'm older. Yeah. Mm, Got it. But you're going to try the, uh, you're going to try, Rube, I know you've tried it, right? The NRL 22 kind of thing or the rip precision rim fire. I've done it here. Um, we're an NRL club here. Uh, Seth and Kellen run an awesome match. Uh, yeah. I, I've done it, and it's a lot of fun. Um, it hasn't got my adrenaline going yet. Really? Yeah. Not we've, yet. We've, How about you, Tucker? We've got uh, a couple guys that are local to my range, my, my long range area range. Um, they, they've started it. They have NRL 22 there, and I just can't. I just cannot do another one. So <laughs> I, they're there, and I'm there, and, I, and, and we'll shoot off the same props. But, I mean, that's – so at least at this place, they're really geared to getting people kind of into the center fire stuff. Or kids, you know. It's okay. great for kids. And it's great for adults, too. Some people love it. Like, they're like, man, I haven't had this much fun at a match ever. It's like, well, great. Yeah. You know, come back, bring some buddies. But uh, for me, too, I think, I think it's more – I'm just interested in – maybe the bigger rifles for now but you know yeah. i also um we with the dealer training that we get to do um you know about 50 to 60 groups a year of long range training so i get to be on the range a lot doing long range so i kind of tend to stay away from that when i'm and you get to be on ranges that have long distances yes i know i'm get i like i was excited to hear about it when it first came out because we've got a little bit of land where we have like 80 yards that's perfect for shooting on mm-hmm. but no more than that and so it's like well i just set up really tiny targets and shoot this thing yeah 
I know everybody. Uh, every, what were you going to say? I was just saying, like, that's what 22s are great for, yeah. right? So the ranges that are limited to 100 yards, this is a perfect option for them to get introduced into that world. You know, maybe they can only practice and shoot there, like, locally. But then when you go out of town, okay, like, this is what we're doing. I've got an understanding for kind of how this works. Yeah. I have you, an immense amount of respect for people who can do that stuff with a rimfire. I'm just not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> You were saying earlier, like, before, you were never really, like, a gun enthusiast so much. Right. Like you got into the sports because you liked the sport. Is that still the case? Are you, or are you starting to, like, no, uh, now I, you kind of nerd out about the guns a little bit, I'm too? I'm all or? gun now, man. That's, that's <laughs> okay. All, <laughs> all right. All right. That's all I think about. That's all okay. I do. When I'm working or doing anything else, it's like, damn, what do we have going on this afternoon? It's like, where am I going? Oh, I need to fix that trigger on that one gun. And Oh, I'm eating. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always something. And, uh, you know, my dad really wasn't into guns. And, uh... So I lived with him for a little while, then moved in with my mom later on. But uh, he, he he was not down with guns. But as soon as I turned eighteen, like I went and got a pump shotgun, and I right. went and Very went, similar story. To, yeah, I, I went, can relate. Went and shot some, you know, some, I think it was five stand at the time, and I just went by myself, and I did that for years, and I had like a, a Glock seventeen for like home defense, personal defense kind of thing. You and that's all your, I had. You didn't for buy really. your shotgun in a parking lot, did you? Yeah. Oh. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I wouldn't have judged. I think it was yeah. a pawn shop a of, or a gun store. A lot or of people buy guns in parking lots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's true. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was wondering because when we were talking about the NRL 22 thing, I know like a lot of the gun enthusiasts around the office here yeah. got bit by that bug pretty hard because oh they were gosh. like, "Well, it's just a new gun I can build." It was I, I, like they yeah. want to shoot it and they enjoy shooting it, but I, I I actually think a lot of people around here get involved in new sports because of the gun that it allows them oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. to build. Well, I mean, we we have the FFL office here, right? And then like the number of CZ 457s and Ruger <laughs> yeah, American Precision Rim Fires and all that stuff that came in for like the last year. It was like, what is all this? Oh, look at all these things. Yeah. I myself <laughs> got bit by a Volkortz. And so I actually built the gun to do the sport that I haven't really played with yet. Well, at least you have a gun when you're ready. Um, I On the gun side of things, like probably my most, and this is nothing, nothing to say negatively about my dissident shotgun or you know, my Seekins rifle or anything like that. But like I, my real interesting guns are not competition guns. Like they're, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I my competition getting, yeah. guns have to perform and they have to go bang every time I pull the trigger. They're all beat up. And so and sometimes up. when they're new in the box, it's like, wow, that's fancy. Yeah. But like after I get used, they get used and abused. Like I would say my most interesting guns are like, you know, family heirlooms or like, uh, yeah. like a hunting rifle, something like that. You know, yeah. like like Scott would say, just a hunting rifle. But uh, yeah, no, I, that the gun, like, they're like a utility I was, knife. I was bit by the gun bug before I was in competition. Yeah, yeah, I, your comp gun, it's it's like a utility knife. It's a like tool. A, it's like a screwdriver. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah they get work. beat. Up. They get beat up. They yeah. get beat up, scuffed up. I mean, they're chewed up. The bottoms of the magwells are just like, <laughs> just a mess under there. I mean, you beat them up pretty bad if you use them a lot. And that's, yeah. I think that's the case with anything. When Any I get a tool, tool, I love nothing more than just like the first time it gets beat up. Just crashed. <laughs> I don't really enjoy that on a $7,000 open gun. But <laughs> no, that's fair. You that's accept a good point. It, you accept it nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm more talking about like a $20 screwdriver. But, no, um, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. There is something satisfying though. You, I, even on things that are nice, I will say, sometimes if I get, like, the first, as long as it's not a major, the yeah. first scuff, yep. kind of like... A little personality. <sighs> well, I it mean, happened. it goes down, it boils down to, again, not to oversimplify this, but it boils down to kind of a desire to be, to, like, legitimize yourself at something, and right? And if, like, you're the one that all your tools sit in your drawers and you never use them, like, are you a poser? Maybe. Right. And as soon as you start using your stuff, like I look at the, I look at the dude, like when I walk up to a match and, and I don't know anybody on a stage and let's just say we get there early and I'm walking a stage while people are shooting. Yeah. And I'm like looking at whose magwell has the most scratches and it is like, <laughs> that's the guy I'm going to watch shoot. Yeah. Like, yeah. Honestly, that's a good idea. Like that's probably the guy to watch out for is the one who's yeah. magwell is the most beat up. A bunch of people are going into their gun room right now with their like yeah. metal, <laughs> their metal mag that they found on the ground somewhere just uh -huh. jamming it in the yeah, magwell. Exactly. Uh, that's funny. But I mean, it all boils down to to the work you put in, right? And like, if if we only learn things when we fail, like if that's if that's what causes us to learn, yeah, and we don't fail very much, we're probably not going to be very good at something. Yeah. 
I'll toss this one your guys' way while we're on the topic of guns. Uh, somebody out there getting their first gun. Uh, maybe it's not even the first gun, but they, they, they might even have a gun or two or something like that. But they want to get a gun that they can do pretty much as many things as possible with. Um, which, uh, what do you guys recommend they go for? You mean like for a competition setting? or Yeah, like they want to be able to go out and shoot competition with it, go to the range, enjoy it, maybe use it for home defense, like that kind of thing. Like it's just the most multifaceted. Is it like the pistol, the shotgun, the carbine? I feel like it's probably not for that specific stuff. Tense the precision rifle, but maybe it no, is. that's a pretty specific item. But you can shoot deer with it, so it's also True. good for that. But I mean, as far as defense range use, you can actually shoot. I mean, I used to go to the range and unload my Glock 17 with my defense bullets and throw it in my bag and then get on the range, put in my match bullets, and I'd just shoot it on the range. So I think a pistol in that regard, just a full mm-hmm. size, full frame gun, would be a, a pretty good place to start. Yeah. I don't have a specific answer. I'm, I mean, like, not to just carbon copy. Talk about what, neuroscience again? Uh, yeah, we'll go into that here at the end of the answer. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to quote uh, a friend of mine, Adam Maxwell, who says the most expensive gun is the one that you never shoot. So <laughs> True. Uh, if we break it down, somebody looks at a $7,000 open gun, and they're like, wow, that's expensive. And I could probably be like, yeah, but it, it's like through the life of the gun, it's only like a half a cent a shot. That's right. You <laughs> know, that. versus one, yeah, right, a lot yeah. less than that. Yeah. But like versus one that um, you buy and you you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to use this all the time, and then you, you never use it because it's so specific for one certain thing. Yeah. Like, honestly, like I practice with my carry gun a lot, but like still my carry gun is not the Low. most shot gun Low in my bag, right? right? Yeah. And so for the price per shot, my carry gun's probably the most expensive gun I own. Same. Yeah. That is one heck of a way of looking at it. Yeah. It's like, well, car reference is a car that you can run to 300,000 miles. It might have been expensive up front, but like per the amount of use, it's probably the cheapest. That's true. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And I didn't mean to steal that from you, but. No, it's all right. I wouldn't have said it because I'm, I'm kind of on like, kind of on like a crap list, you yeah. know, as far as car references. Yeah, there was too it. many. I front loaded it big time <laughs> when we first started the podcast. Yeah. Making up for that. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't answer the question. Is it the pistol then? Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, full size pistol. Yeah. Just like Same. armor frame, basic. Can any, be? any full sure. size. Any okay. full. You can have a CZ. I mean, any, anything that, you know, right on. do multiple tasks. Yeah. And actually, to expand on that, a friend of mine reached out to me uh, a couple months ago and asked if he should buy a uh, CZ Shadow 2 or uh, a, a polymer framed lower cost pistol. And I was like, What's your budget? Do you want to shoot it a lot or do you want to look at it a lot? Because <laughs> once you shoot that CZ, you're gonna sh- want to shoot it all the time. Yeah, that's mm. nice, and that's what he bought. Yeah, it's a good gun. That's good to know, for sure, right? Like, I mean, like get, I don't know, like not to overquote like this, but buy nice stuff and you'll use it. Don't buy nice stuff, you probably won't use it because it sucks to God, use. It's so true. You have to fix it. Is. It is true. The everybody old always buy wants once, to cry once. Everybody always wants to start out, and I get it because I've been there. And Me sometimes, too. Me too. sometimes the cheap stuff works. But then you like buy something else eh. a second time and a third time. Like, okay, this is what I need. Like my reloading presses. I started out with a Lee, AP, whatever it was, and then I went to the Horny one, which was night and day better. But if I just would have bought the better press the first time, yes. it's just easier that way. Correct. Yeah. Uh, well, good stuff. Yep. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Multi-sport competition shooting athletes. Both yeah. of you guys were here. But Tucker, it was Tucker awesome especially. talking to you. I appreciate you having me. I hope we'll get to a shoot a PRS match together and we'll maybe drag him with us. Absolutely. All yeah, right. for sure. Sign maybe uh, and Mark might be there and you can see uh, all of his skill and uh, talk about a gun guy. Mark's gun is pretty off the charts. Yeah. It's that same one we, uh, for those listening out there, it's the same one from our um, pro, ber- pro build versus homemade build. Mark's got some like rifle that's probably worth in excess of nine thousand dollars. Carbon they, barrel, all they the They get they get up stuff. there. Oh yeah, yeah. You can go. I mean, you can get into it for fifteen hundred bucks, or you can spend fifteen thousand bucks. <laughs> probably yeah. a lot higher than that. But <laughs> you can spend what you want to spend, but the good thing is you can get into it for cheap if you want. So yeah, kind of fits well for everyone. Awesome. 
Well, uh, for those listening out there, uh, if you do multiple sports, why don't you let us know? Hit us up in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or go over to Instagram, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, if you want to hear more stuff about competition shooting as well, it's been a minute since we've done a competition shooting episode, but let us know what that kind of thing would be. And uh, go check out Tucker. Tucker, are you on like, uh, you do the social media thing? Or yeah, you just, yeah, yeah, it's uh, Tucker Schmidt on Facebook or Tucker underscore S underscore 2A on Instagram. Got it. And if you're a myelin scientist, let me know because I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> Privately, please. Yes, Ruben would like to fact check everything that he up said. In the DMs, <laughs> please. Yes. Uh, that is at 3 Gun Rube. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye. 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 There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.